Hi, my name is Frankie. Thank you for listening to To My Mom. I never listen. My pleasure to be joined by the head coach of Indiana State, Chad Killinger. Coach, uh, you've got your team at six and six right now. This is a group of young women. The ones that were there last year anyway, that only won five games. They only won five games a year before. You got things rolling, it seems, in your first year. Yeah, I mean, they're, uh, they've done a great job of buying in. And, and part of that I contribute to uh, or attribute to the fact that, you know, we did um, – I try to figure out how they need to be coached. Um, and I think each individual is different as far as that's concerned. But, but uh, we did something really simple. We did one of those wordles where I gave them about 30 words. And I said, you got to pick seven words that mean the most to you. And as they did that, the, one, the three things that came out, number one was energy. Uh, but then the next two things were respect and confidence. And so really just looking at those three things, that's how we've approached the season uh, from the time, you know, everybody got here in July and we had the newcomers in as well. We just really um, tried to take that approach and, and uh, you know, they've responded really well, worked really hard. Um, you know, these kids would run through a brick wall for us and I'd run through a brick wall for them. You know, it's funny you say energy because somebody asked me what my word was for 2022 and I said energy was going to be it. So how does that manifest itself for you on the floor with your team? Well, I think uh, I think one uh, with with confidence and respect. I think there's some trust that's built there, and then I think as that trust, that energy really starts to pick up. Um, they believe what you're saying, and 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 uh, you know, in the locker room or after a win, celebrating in the locker room. I, I'm not one of those that believes you have to record every locker room celebration and put it on social media. And I think I think those are private moments for your team. Um, now there may be some that that do eventually get put on there, but. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, just feeding off each other and, and uh, believing in each other. And I know one of our girls the other day made a comment. Um, she was doing an interview for a local newspaper. And uh, one thing she said to the reporter was, you know, coach believes in all of us the same. Um, you know, it's not, you know, we're, it's not where we look at, at number one on the roster and number 12 on the roster and treat those kids any differently. Everybody gets treated the same. Um, you know, we try to do the best for, for each individual. And, and I think as you do that, then, you know, everybody just responds. You know, I want to ask you um, about your your locker room culture, because a lot of times we talk about culture on the court and what it looks like in the community and other things. But that's pretty interesting that, you know, we came up in a time in the game where what happened in the locker room stayed in the locker room. And that's not always right. the case anymore. Why do you feel so strongly about that now? Well, I just, you know, again, I think it goes back to trust. Um, you know, we we. Uh, I think these, the, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about maturity um, at times with, with our group and, and um, but you got to let them be individuals as well. I mean, we have one young lady on the team that she likes to kind of dance around and, and uh, be a little playful and that's how she gets ready. And I'm not shutting that down because that's not what I believe. Um, I think each person's a little bit differently. Now I believe that kid can be a leader on our team, but at the same time, I've told her like you, in order to get people to follow you, you've got to make them understand when you're serious and when you're, when you're kind of playing around. And so um, but I think that goes back to like that locker room and trusting everybody that's in there with you. And, and um, you know, it's, I don't, you know, it, I, I don't think there's like a magic word that you say as a coach to, to build that or anything. I think they, they have to see that you're genuine, um, that, that you care about them. I mean, I love these kids to death. Um, I, I treat them like my own. And um, I think once they see that, then, then uh, again, it's just easier for the process to build quicker. So, Coach, your other two words are respect and confidence. So you start out Missouri Valley play and you knock off Drake. What does that do for your team and your program this early in the season? Well, I think confidence, obviously, big boost. Uh, and I think from a respect standpoint, it makes people, you know, understand that that it's not like it was in the past where, where you know, you looked at us as probably a win on your schedule or uh, if you had a tough game coming up, you knew you were going to get healthy playing Indiana State the next time out. Um, and, you know, we didn't really talk much about the past um, before that game. We really um, – I mentioned it one time. I said, last year you guys went, went, went up there and, and lost by 40, right? And they're like, yeah, and I said, well, that's not going to happen this time. And that's, that was the gist of it. I mean, we didn't harp on it. We didn't uh, play that up, you know, any locker room postings or anything like that. We just really hit on it real quick, said we're not – you know, that's not going to happen. We're not going to be disrespected. Um, you know, we've been a good road team. I mean, we're four and three on the road. Um, two and two at home. Um, we probably need to play more road games than home games. Um, but, uh, um, but I mean, I think that's, that's part of it. And I think, I think for our young women, 
seeing that and seeing those results, I think just makes them want to work that much harder and, and believe in what we're doing that much more. Well, when you go on the road and you play Drake and you make them turn it over 30 times and you score 32 points off, and right now at the time of this taping, you're number 12 in the nation in turnovers forced. I'm assuming that's a big part of the game plan and how you go about approaching things when you put your team on the floor. Yeah, and it's uh, probably a big change from what we talked about at the beginning of the year. You know, we talked about playing fast and running that secondary break and, um, you know, getting getting a lot of shots up. And, and it's kind of um, – change just just based on our situation and it, it kind of became something where offensively I let the girls kind of play at the pace they were comfortable at um so if they weren't quite ready to play that fast we can work on that and in the future we can we can try to get to the pace I want to play at but uh from an offensive standpoint right now I feel like we're playing at the pace they're comfortable playing at so we really had to figure out how were we going to be able to be competitive and with that it just became came down to the defensive side of the ball and um you know I've always been I've always thought you know, always, always thought when I became a head coach that I was going to be this offensive person that pushed the ball and we scored a lot of points. And everywhere I've gone, it's just been the opposite. We've, we've always started off with defense and building our teams. And obviously our offense gets better in a year or two. But, um, but they really bought into that. And I think um, it's not complicated. Um, we know we have a system in terms of how we guard each screen, um, how we guard a down screen, how we guard a back screen, how we guard a cross screen. Um, and we've worked on that since, you know, preseason practice began. And so now we get into scouting reports and everything else. And it's not, we're not changing things. We're just kind of reviewing, Hey, here, you know, they run this set, this is going to be a down screen. How do we guard it? And they say it and we're like, okay, so we guard it. And, um, you know, we want to put some pressure on our opponents and, and uh, we have to force turnovers. We're not a great three point shooting team right now. Um, we've had a couple of games where we've shot it. Well, we have kids that can shoot it, but I think that goes back to confidence um but uh but no turning people over that's just kind of become what we've what we are and and so I think every year a team's identity is a little bit different like talk about culture of a program identity of a program I think those are two different things I think your identity is what that individual team is and what they're good at and right now for us that's just defense uh making it hard on people um you know and when you harass people for 40 minutes, we're not even pressing, uh, you know, we're, we're doing that in a half court. So when you really just put some pressure on people in the half court and make them have to make plays, I think that just wears on teams. Chad, you've been in a lot of different places over your 25 years. Um, you know, you've had quite a length of experience in a lot of different places, but one of those particular places I want to ask you about, because we're talking about defense. I know you spent some time with Dan D'Antoni at Marshall and um, I know from your experience at Marshall, you had to pick up some of his offensive traits. I mean, they play fast. That's a team that definitely rolls the ball out and they get after it. What um, about your time at Marshall or any of your background with any coaches that you've been uh, on their staffs that you've uh, actually taken some of the pieces there and applied it to your team? Yeah, well, I think um, in, in the places I've been, obviously I'll study what the men's teams are doing. So I think, you know, obviously Dan did a great job. Um, and then being there working with Royce, um, what, one thing that I figured out is you got to be who you are and you've got to do what you do. Like when Royce hired me at, at Marshall, one of the things he talked about was, um, you know, hey, we want you to kind of put the triangle offense in for us. And, and uh, Roxanne White had played in the triangle when she was at SFA and, and uh, as a player. And so she really, you know, had a good concept with it as well. But we got about three or four games into that season and I was like, coach, we do what you're comfortable with, you know, because it just what we were like one and three. And I was like, this isn't working. Like, well, let's just run your flex. Uh, let's do what you guys want to do offensively and, and do it. And uh, and so I think that, you know, that experience there alone taught me, like, you got to stick with what you know and what you believe in um, and what you're comfortable in doing. And so everywhere I've, you know, everywhere I've gone, whether it was, you know, East Carolina, uh, down at Nickel State with, with Doobie, um, just, you know, you go in as an assistant, you want to change some things, but you realize in the long run that you're better off just doing what the head coach wants to do. Um, and so for me getting here, uh, obviously we hired a great staff and they all have their ideas, but, but it's really boiled down to like, you got to do what you're comfortable doing. Um, you know, I look at, um, you know, growing up in Bloomington, Indiana, Coach Knight, seeing Coach Katie, how tough those, those guys were, their defensive backgrounds that those teams had. Um, you know, watching, uh, you know, Tom Izzo. I'm a big fan of Tom Izzo. Uh, you know, Tara Vanderveer, Coach Summit, like all those people are people that I feel like I've drawn from 
in my career, whether, you know, watching from afar, just seeing some of the things they did offensively or defensively. But really, I think it comes down to like that standard that you're willing to accept as a head coach um, in terms of how you do things. Um, and then being, again, being comfortable with what you're doing. And so really convincing the players that this is the way they need to play is probably the hardest part of it. But, um, you know, all of them in our meetings are like, coach, I like it. This is how, you know, I fit better in this system. Um, so all that stuff has been very positive for us so far. Well, it is about building relationships with your players. I mean, you got to figure out what the skill set is and how you can put the pieces together. And I'm just curious because your wife played at Indiana, so she's played at a high level. What kind of influence has she had on the way you manage your players or the way you see the game? Well, she's probably the best unpaid assistant in women's college <laughs> basketball. Um, she has to listen to me rant and rave when I get home, after whether it's a win or loss. Um, a lot of times she's my voice of reason, um, kind of calms me down when I need it. But, uh, uh, you know, watching her teams play, um, and obviously with, uh, Coach Malone that's on our staff played with her at Indiana, um, and kind of seeing how the, how uh, Coach Izzard at that time, you know, they had Quasey Barnes, who's a 6'2 post player, ended up playing in the WNBA, and my wife was a good forward and could shoot the ball. So they kind of put those two in high-low situations and, and played off that quite a bit. Um, and, and I think just kind of learning how to use those players to their strengths um, is something she's been great at. And, you know, my very first head coaching job, I was the head women's coach and assistant men's coach, both at Jacksonville Junior College down in Texas. And uh, she was my only assistant, unpaid. And so, um, so I mean, when it came down to like condition, like I deferred to her on everything with conditioning, weight program. I had never, I didn't have a lot of experience on the women's side, obviously doing that. And so um, being able to have her there by my side to kind of get things rolling, get things started has obviously been a big influence throughout the whole time. But, uh, you know, she's she's um, she's not your typical coach's wife that you're going to you know look in the stands and she's going to be nervous during a game. or anything. She's probably trying to send me signals on what plays we need to run or who I need to sub in or out or something like that. But uh, and then she's obviously has her hands full with our five kids in the crowd. So it's it's uh, you know, been a relationship that's obviously been been uh, very great for both of us. Yeah, I could see your wife uh, more handling a clipboard than I can see her um, biting sure. nails or all your team's doing. Um, sure. Your kids, you, you mentioned all your kids, right? Your own kids. Uh, yeah. How do you guys manage it? Like, do you have a huge calendar in the kitchen or, I mean, break it down for us. Like, what's it like uh, when you get in the morning? Does everybody have cereal or are you making a full Well, they're kind of on their own for breakfast, I'll be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a night owl. So I'm usually up till one or two o'clock in the morning, watching film or playing practice or doing whatever. We actually practiced last semester at nine in the morning, which was the first time that we'd ever done that, or I'd ever done that, um, as a head coach. And so wanting that practice planned and everything, um, I'd spend a lot of time later in the evenings doing that stuff, but, uh, uh, I'd much rather prefer practicing in the afternoon and having the day to kind of piece that stuff together. But no, I mean, she, she actually teaches, um, and she drives about 24, Five, probably 25, 30 minutes a day um, to go teach. And so I get the kids up in the morning and, and get them all to school. We all load up in the car and I drive them to school and um, drop them off. I'm She's better at technology than I am. So she has everything on her phone with reminders. I have the color coordinated calendar on my desk in the office. And it's like each kid has their, our, our daughter decided to play basketball this year after basketball season started. I've kind of tried to steer our kids away from basketball just because of the, I feel like there's a lot of pressure dad being a head coach for so long and mom playing high division one. So we've tried to lead them into soccer and baseball and softball and other sports. But uh, so it's not as hectic right now because we only have two playing sports. Um, but while we we're in Iowa, my wife did text me and told me that she signed our, uh, uh, youngest son and our middle daughter up for soccer for winter soccer so I'm like let's just add it on to it I guess but uh, no I mean you want to make sure your kids are uh, doing things to stay active especially during the pandemic I mean it's obviously been a rough time for a lot of different people and, and uh, you know we went through that where they were all at home all the time so it was different for us when the, when all the quarantine stuff first started because there was five of them in the house so they had people to keep them busy and occupied and to play with and and everything. And so now it's like, okay, you know, they're proven being able to play sports and do all this stuff. So we're keeping them active and, and out there and, and uh, really proud of what they do. I mean, they're, they, uh, they work hard. They, they uh, take care of their academic side of things. And I couldn't imagine a better situation to, to raise kids in than a college environment. Uh, just the diversity that they come across and what they are able to enjoy and see and the relationships they develop with our players are every bit as important as 
uh, the relationships that I develop with them or, or anything else. Do you get everybody's lunch right? Or is it some buy, some bring? Well, How's that? Yeah, going? most of them just get it at school. But our youngest is, is she just turned six, December 17th. And uh, she's probably the most demanding. Um, she will, she'll make, she'll tell me, dad, you need to make my lunch at night. And I'll be like, I'll make it in the morning. And then we'll be about to run late. And she's like, dad, you didn't make my lunch. And I'll have to make it before we leave or else she's not happy. And so, uh, she's, she's probably the, the biggest diva in the morning, um, of, of all the ones we got. So, but it's, it's fun. She, uh, um, uh, you know, seeing her around our players already, um, uh, just in the short time we've been here, has been, been incredible. They, they, uh, they love having her around and she's, she's an interesting kid. Oh, I, I joke. I'm like, if we'd have had her first, I don't know if we'd have had any more. Uh, but at the same time, I think she's the way she is because she's the youngest of six. So, um, you know, she's fighting for survival every, every day. That's right. Survival of the fittest when you've got that many and they're all sitting yes. around the table. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, you mentioned raising your family around a college environment. I mean, having your kids at practice, having them around your players, how has that um, worked to not only help your kids be better, but how about your team? Well, I think, um, and I've, and I've said this for a long time and it's, it's, um, obviously not something you do intentionally or anything like that, but, um, I really feel like our players get to see me in a lot of different lights. Um, you know, they get to see me as a dad, they get to see me as a husband, um, even with our staff, they get to see, see me as a friend to them at, at times when they need it and everything. And so I think that those, um, you know, the ability for them to see that really helps uh, them start to learn to, to, to trust that, that what we're doing is in their best interest as well. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's uh, we played, let's see, two games this year. Um, one against Stevens College, you had a, a, one of my former players was actually an assistant on their staff. And so, um, I mean, the kids saw her and they all ran up and gave each other big hugs and you know, she can't believe how big they've gotten. It's been about four years since she had seen them in person and, and everything. And so um, them being able to have those relationships when, 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 uh, you know, we, we, I'm long gone and dead. They'll have, I know they've got a huge support family all over the country that that's there to take care of them. What do you think has been the biggest surprise for you, Chad, with your team or, or with your personnel in your first year uh, at Indiana state? Uh, I think probably the biggest thing would be just, um, how resilient they are. Um, you know, you wouldn't look at a team, really, I wouldn't personally look at a team that won five games two years ago and five games last year and just think, man, these are tough kids. Um, and, and I feel like they've really shown that they are. I mean, we've obviously lost Summer Pitzer um, eight days before the season started to a meniscus tear. Uh, lost Hattie Westfield, uh, Westerfield, sorry, in the uh, summertime in, in July. She tore her ACL, so we knew she was going to be out. But then losing Summer, and then having Adrian tear her ACL, you know, fifth game of the year against Jacksonville State. I mean, it would have been real easy to just everybody cash it in and be like, all right, we're just going to get through this year and and whatever happens, happens. And let's start recruiting for next year and, and you know, focus on that more than the games or whatever. And, and instead, we've just really balanced balanced it out in terms of we're going to keep doing what we we're supposed to do. That's, that's the mindset that I gave them. Um, I'm not big on talking about injuries over and over again. Or, you know, we didn't bring them in and say, hey, you need to score. You know, Adrian was averaging 14. I think at the time she was maybe the fourth leading scorer in the Valley when she went out. Um, we didn't set anybody down and say, we need five points from you and five points from you and four points from her to, to make up what Adrian was doing or we need five more rebounds or whatever it was. We just, we showed up at, you know, the next day, obviously we showed up against Georgia Southern and just played and uh, won that game. And I think that kind of jump started things. Since Adrian's been out, we're, I think, five and two. Um, and it's, you know, I feel for teams right now who are dealing with COVID, uh, you know, issues and they're, you know, they're losing players, um, you know, unexpectedly and, and, and everything we've, we've been dealing with that all year. Um, you know, we've had, I think six practices since Thanksgiving, um, with 10 kids in practice. That's it. Um, <laughs> so in that, with that being the case, we found a way, like, you know, I'm used to that being in junior college where, you know, you just show up and if you got eight in practice, you practice, you develop, you know, design your practice around those eight kids. And you can still do scouting stuff with, with certain aspects of a team's offense that they're going to run and do that in shell or do that in three on three drills. And um, so we've taken that approach and, and, you know, just kind of kept moving forward and the kids buy into it. Um, you know, I think if you, as a head coach, you panic and you show that you're, you don't believe you're going to win any games, the kids are going to pick up on that. And that's just not been the approach we've taken on the kids. We just show up every day and, 
again, we take it one day at a time. Sounds old, cliche-ish type speak, but that's what we do. And, and I mean, to me, that's all you can really do. But, uh, you know, we've, we even, I think one game we, 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 we've dressed nine, like several games, um, you know, and not even played all nine in, in some of them. So, um, you know, it's been, been an interesting uh, year to this point, and obviously it's gonna gonna stay interesting, I guess, with with the way COVID's hitting the world again. Yeah, I, I mean, staying resilient, being resourceful, those sounds like those are part of your DNA coming up through the game, just because of some of the smaller places that you've been and you've you've built a path, you know, for yourself to be a D1 head coach. Uh, what do you think's been the the biggest challenges for you personally along that journey? Uh this will sound, probably sound bad, but probably belief in myself, you know, like you just wonder if you're ever going to get that chance. Um, you, you go to games and you watch coaches and, and you see how good they are. Um, you believe you're that good. Um, and, and you just wonder if like, are you, is anyone ever going to give you that opportunity? If there, is anyone ever going to give you that chance? Cause you know, a lot of it's about who, you know, and, and, and what you've done when you've been around certain people and um, you know, that opens the door for you, but then you've got to be successful, you know, once you get there. And so everywhere we've gone, we've been successful. Um, but, but that's where probably my wife comes into play more than anything. I mean, she's, she's been my biggest cheerleader and supporter. And, um, when, when I know you don't get division one jobs by really applying for them, but, uh, but she was always like, send your stuff in. You never know. Somebody might see it. Somebody might know somebody that knows somebody that, that sees your resume and, and you're, you're good enough, you know, you can do it. And, um, I think when we're at ECU, we kind of, kind of started to, to have myself believe that um, obviously we were nine and two and I was the interim head coach there, but that was not a comfortable situation just from the standpoint that we weren't doing. Uh, that's not why I went there. Obviously, uh, you know, I went there to be an assistant coach and then we, we was so late in the year that we just kept running the same system offensively, defensively that they'd had in place for, for several years. And so right now I just, I'm a lot more comfortable um because we're running our stuff we're doing running our offense we're we're doing the things that we like to do from a defensive standpoint and and so I feel really good about where we're at you know 12 games in and and uh, you know I'm excited about the future but I'm just as excited about the next practice um uh, just I love being on the on the court with these kids they like I said they work hard um uh, I can't complain about them at all they they uh um they do everything we ask the last thing I want to ask you, Chad, is just about networking. I mean, you you sort of uh, mentioned it there. You know, you don't apply for a head coaching job. It it sort of happens through your network of people that you know. Um, some people have agents, some don't. Uh, some people just allow their hard work to take over. You know that they're going to notice me because I'm going to work hard, and they're going to see I'm the hardest working person in the building. Um, where are you on how networking is so important, especially for young coaches out there? What are some tips that you would give a young coach about how to network themselves into maybe another job? Well, I think the, the biggest thing that I did was work camps. Um, and I would just, I would go work as many camps. I think one summer I was actually a, a men's assistant coach at Lincoln trail college at the time. Like I was making $8,400 for the year. Um, that was what I was getting paid, but I only got paid for 10 months. So uh, I had to find a way to make some money over the summer. And so I, I went and worked camps. I think one summer I worked like 11 camps, maybe 12 camps, but I was, you know, actually I was on, you know, being on the men's side at the time, but I was, you know, I was working Michigan state, Kentucky, went to Maryland. Um, and you really like when you go to those camps uh, now, obviously I'd be, I'd be trying to work South Carolina, uh, Connecticut, Stanford, Tennessee. I mean, I would be, I would be trying to get to the big dogs <laughs> in the, and that's what I tried to do. And so, you know, at one point I probably knew half the, you know, back then half of the men's uh, head coaches in the big 10 um, just from working camps. And so, I mean, that's my biggest thing would be work camps, um, send out stuff about graduate assistant jobs. Don't be afraid to take a job. Uh, don't worry about the pay. Uh, go and, and work hard. Like you said, if you go and work hard and do what's asked of you, then people are going to notice that. And it may not be uh, it may be somebody in the same conference, um, you know, from a, from a junior college perspective, I've seen, seen people move from one school to the other um, into better situations just because those head coaches saw how hard they worked for what they were getting at that other school. And so it's the same, no matter the level. Uh, but, uh, you know, being it, being it, I always um, kind of thought about trying to be a graduate assistant and, and everything. But, but um, at the time, my wife was, was um, you know, we had a kid. 
And so being a GA probably was not a good idea um, with us having a, having a child. So um, while you're young and single, I think, I mean, anything you can do to get your name out there and to show how hard you're willing to work is good. But, but that working camps and, and, you know, emailing stuff out. I mean, I get a lot of stuff from, from people who want to be GAs and, and um, I may not answer them all right away, but, but I will definitely answer every one of them because I don't, I don't want to be that person that, that uh, passes somebody up or, or doesn't give somebody the time of day. And then Chad, when you do have time, if you have any, between six kids, uh, you know, your team, uh, you got them off to a six and six start. I know you're crunching the tape in the, in the wee hours of the night. When you do have some free time, what is something that you might do as a hobby or something that you do that's outside the game? Well, that's where I'm probably, that's probably the weakest part of, of myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't find a lot of things to do outside of, of, uh, that, um, we have a, we have a little, uh, um, you know, my son and I are big NASCAR fans, but obviously NASCAR is not going on right now. Um, so we, 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 we go to a couple races, um, a year, uh, over the last few years, I didn't have that opportunity, you know, growing up. So now that we, we have a chance, we go to go to a few races, um, but I, I, I really watch probably more football than I do basketball. I did see, uh, uh, you know, Indiana and Maryland yesterday. My, my sister-in-law's the Dobo at Indiana. I didn't know if you knew that. Um, uh, Liz Honiger. No, I did not know that. Yeah. Liz is a good, she's great. She's been around a long time. She's terrific yeah. at it now. Yes, she's, she's, that's my sister-in-law. So uh, we caught okay. the end of that game. We caught the end of that game yesterday. So we watched a lot of their games. Um, I'm as funny as it sounds. I don't watch a lot of basketball anymore. I used to, um, but uh, you know, I watch I watch a lot of end games. Um, you know, when they're on, just to see what people are doing in the game situation. Because so I feel like I'll probably steal more from that. <laughs> um, yeah, when but, you get uh, to a conference play, though, I mean, when you get to conference play, uh, everything shrinks, and then the last quarter in the women's yep. game and the last five minutes of the men's game, uh, yep. that's when all the action happens, really. Yeah. And that's what I'll, I'll kind of watch that and start taking some notes and, and uh, steal some plays. And I saw some good stuff. Jeff Walls grew up, uh, drew up against Georgia Tech <laughs> um, mm-hmm. that I saw. And uh, so I, I, you know, I watch a little bit of stuff like that just to try to add some stuff to kind of our, our repertoire that we can run at the end of games. And, and, uh, and, you know, I watch a lot of NFL, watch a lot of college football. And that's, that's, that's probably, that's probably my relaxation time. I wish I read more. I, yeah. I have all these books on these bookshelves everywhere. And I'm like, I don't, that's just dust collectors. Um, you know, I like, I like listening to some music, but it's mainly in the car um, when I'm driving. So it's, it's not, uh, but I probably need a few more hobbies. So if you got any ideas, send them, send them my way. <laughs> I'm going to hit you up for all your late game strategies uh, later on in the season and find out how it's going. All that film watching you do at the end of games. That's cool. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll be more than happy to share. <laughs> well, Chad, thank you so much for being with us on the Missouri Valley Weekly. Uh, you, you've done a terrific job with your young team, and uh, to get them at six and six, and to have an upset win over Drake on the road already on your resume, I think your energy, your respect, and your confidence—your three words—are definitely working. Thank you. I appreciate it. And again, appreciate you having me on, and just everything you do to to uh, expand the game and and uh, get us out there. I do appreciate all that. All right. Thank you, Chad. Thank you.